Um, today's talk is the penultimate lecture in our series um, that we're doing to honor World War I. Um, but I'd like to introduce today our speaker. His name is Stephen Jaffe. He's a writer and historian specializing in the history of New York City. Um, he has worked at the Center for Jewish History in New York City and the New York Historical Society, where he served as senior project historian, and also at the South Street Seaport Museum. He's a graduate of Princeton, and he received his doctorate from Harvard University. Um, in addition to his book, New York at War, which conveniently is for sale in our gift shop, and uh, Mr. Jaffe will be happy to autograph it for you after the talk. Um, he also wrote a book called Capital of Capital, Money, Banking, and Power in New York City, 1784 to 2012. His work has been published in New York Journal of American History and Seaport New York's History Museum. He is joining us all the way from Maplewood, New Jersey. So please welcome him to the museum, Stephen Jaffe. Good afternoon. Thanks, Eileen and Bob, and thanks to uh, the donors as well on my behalf. Um, Somehow I left out of that list of my, my sort of my CV that I am currently working as a curator at the Museum of the City of New York in Manhattan. And um, let's see, the first actual, before I, I launch into this topic, I wanted to do a little bit of a sales pitch. Um, while you're waiting for August and, um, and the exhibition to open here on, uh, on Hoboken and World War I, I very much invite you to come to jump the river, come on over and uh, see us at 103rd Street and Fifth Avenue at the Museum of the City of New York, which I'm sure over the years many of you have visited. We have a very new... Um, We've sort of incarnation at the museum. Um, we have, and, and the, the two, there are any number of ex exhibitions you should come over and see. But the two I wanted to highlight today were on the far right there. First of all, we do have a World War I exhibition up now called Posters and Patriotism Selling World War I in New York. Um, I think well worth seeing if you're interested in this topic. Um, Hoboken does feature uh, in, uh, sort of uh, uh, sporadically in the exhibition. It's mostly about New York City, of course. Uh, and that exhibition will be open until October 9th. Um, the other big project I really invite and encourage you to come visit is New York at its core, which you see is the left image on the screen, which is our new uh, uh, long-term three gallery exhibition on the entire history of the city of New York from 1609 when Hudson sailed here and encountered the Lenape Indians uh, all the way up to 2012, Hurricane Sandy and beyond. We have a future city laboratory as part of this project. This is something the city has never had. New York City has ne never had a full-fledged long-term exhibition explaining or seeking to explain the entire history of the city with 400 artifacts, interactives, film, and so forth. So really, come on over. I think you, uh, if you're interested even just in the history of the region, let alone New York City, um, I think you will, uh, your time will be repaid if you come pay us a visit. So without further ado, let us talk about uh, uh, New York City and Greater New York um, and, and World War I. And I should say also I'm honored to be part of your series um, just knowing that uh, you've had Jeffrey Sammons and Chad Millman and Howard Blom and my friend Chris Ziegler McPherson here. I feel in very good, and others, I feel in very good uh, company. And each of them has taken, of course, a different framework or lens for interpreting or explaining um, what's interesting about World War I. Um, I'm going to use the framework of New York City. Uh, and here you see, however, how, of course, when we talk about New York City, greater New York in the early 20th century, we we're also uh, at least, to some extent, alluding to Hudson County 
uh, New Jersey and other surrounding areas. This is a uh, bird's eye view that was published in 1912. And of course, and, and pardon me while I'm not gonna be doing this the whole time, but of course here's Manhattan, uh, Brooklyn, Queens, uh, the Bronx, Staten Island, and Hoboken is up around here, Jersey City, Bayonne, of course. And we all know, I don't have to convince this audience, I don't think, if you know anything about Hoboken history, that uh, the relationship between New York City and Hoboken over the centuries has been, shall we say, complicated. And uh, it might be called a love, hate, love, some more hate, maybe even some more hate, a relationship. Um, and yet, um, it's also, I think, clear, uh, arguably, that it's a shared history. Um, and the, this view that you see right now on the screen really explains a lot of that shared history. It's the geography is destiny, that, that these municipalities did share this harbor. The, ec the economy and social history of this region uh, was, was very much intertwined. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we talk about uh, a, a lens, which is, I'll be talking very much about New York City, but a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about today uh, pertain not only to Hoboken, but actually the entire nation, really, uh, during the World War I era. The other thing I'll point out about this first slide before I go forward is another significant um, uh, fact, which uh, this was really this beautiful print. Uh, I'm looking at, I'm pointing over here because I'm looking at it on the screen over here, but it's the same image you're seeing on the screen. Uh, it was an advertisement really for Knickerbocker beer, which was uh, uh, ish, uh, uh, produced by Jacob Ruppert, who many of you will know was the owner of the New York Yankees in its glory days, 1915 uh, into the 30s. He's the guy who oversaw the Babe Ruth era. But the other thing that's interesting, of course, was that Jacob Ruppert was a proud German American. And it's easy to forget how German not only Hoboken was in this period, but New York City as well. And that's one of the things we're going to be uh, examining um, in these images. So going forward, the other connection, the, mo the most perhaps obvious connection between Hoboken and New York City for our story today is you know, the fact that when we talk about the Ellis Island experience, that, that, that wave of immigration from Central and Southern and Eastern and Northern Europe at the turn of the century, um, yes, we're talking about Ellis Island, which you see on the lower left, but you're also talking about Hoboken, New Jersey, which you see on the upper right, the, that row upon row of North German Lloyd and Hamburg American Line and Holland America Line piers. And if you go down a little bit south into Jersey City, the Red Star Line. When my grandparents immigrated to New York, uh, New York City, and they did end up living in the city uh, around 1905, 1906, uh, I'm all but certain that my grandfather really landed at the Hamburg America Line uh, pier in Hoboken, and my grandmother, who was on the Red Star Line from Antwerp, would have landed in Jersey City. So that whole funnel of people into the greater New York area and across the country is, of course, very much a Hudson County story as well as a New York City story. But we are, and here you've got the statistics that you see in the lower uh, right for this period. Uh, the New York City population uh, in 1910 was 4.8 million people. 1.9 million, 1 million of them were immigrants, or 40% of the city's population, all immigrants. And, and uh, let's see what I'm trying. All immigrants and their New York-born children were well, were well over two-thirds of the city's total population. So if you're talking about immigrants and second generation, the children of immigrants in, in 1910 or just before the war, um, they're well over uh, two thirds of New York City's population. It's a, it's a, it's a city of immigrants. Um, as much of that, as that is a cliche, it's also very true. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna go through each of these immigrant groups to show how during World War I, or at least to argue how during World War I, it really is a city not only at war, with itself in terms of different groups jostling and being in conflict with each other because of World War I, but even within each of these groups, the sort of soul searching and internal 
debates, heartaches, disputes that went on, that that's what makes New York City so interesting, I think, uh, for, this, for this particular topic. So to begin with, German Americans. Um, the ex as I said before with Ruppert, the extent to which New York was a German city is something that completely eludes us today. Um, and in this period, it's over 800,000 German and Austrian New Yorkers, counting Austrians as native German speakers who very much identified with a larger sort of pan-German um, cultural identity by and large in this period. Um, and uh, immigrants, Germans, immigrants, German and Austrian immigrants and their children are about 17% of the New York City population in 1910. But that's an understatement because it leaves out, that's based on the census of 1910 where we've got those figures. That leaves out the third and fourth generation German Americans who uh, don't enter into the statistics. And if you start go saying that it's well above 17%, you get a sense that the German community uh, was larger. And here you just have a bunch of images of the extent to which German culture and business and politics and music um, were sort of embedded in the daily life of the city. Beer hall on the left, uh, musicians uh, on top, and then below them, uh, female members of a Liederkranz society great tradition of, uh, of vocal music brought over from Central Europe by Germans to New York. The view in the lower right is of actually East 14th Street, uh, really just at about where Union Square is today. Um, and you're looking east, and that, that dramatic building on the right is the German bank. It's a German-American-founded German -founded bank. And if you look carefully on the signs, it's hard to see, but it says Rothskeller. This, you may remember, the old Luchow's restaurant, for good reason, was, was, was here, because it was one of the last vestiges of what was not known as Klein Deutschland. It was little Germany on the, on the northern part of the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And of course, there are German communities of thousands upon thousands of people in each of the other boroughs. Uh, in, this, in this area, a great amount of pride. Um, and you see in the lower left that motto, which was a common saying, Germania, our mother, Colombia, our bride. In other words, this was a saying at the time, I can be German and American. I don't have to make the choice. I'm proud to be American. I'm glad I'm here. But being German, having a German cultural, ethnic, national identity is very important to me as a German American, and many, many people felt this way. Whoops, there we go, okay. So the war breaks out, August 1914 in Europe, with Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Turkey lining up against England, France, Belgium, and Tsarist Russia. And uh, immediately you have, on the lower left, you have uh, German immigrants, many of whom had not taken out citizenship, uh, were technically still, legal, in terms of German law, were reservists uh, in the German military. And, and, and many of them voluntarily swarmed, carrying the German and American flags, swarmed down Broadway, marched to the German consulate, and signed up to ship back out to Germany to fight for the Kaiser. Actually, so did English and French reservists in New York, and they actually got into fistfights in the street because they were fighting over their flags uh, at this time. So the city is very much, we're not in the war yet, of course, and not until April of 1917. This is a European problem. But so many Europeans are here that many of them feel they need to go back to the fatherland or the motherland to do their bit. And really through those first two or three years of the war, you have a very overt and, and um, sometimes very assertive German and Austrian American presence in New York saying, hey, who's to say that the allies get, to get, get always to monopolize public opinion or the view uh, that, uh, that you know, everything that they do is right and correct and righteous? Because of course, America, from the beginning of the war, because of, we spoke English and because of business and cultural ties to England and a sense of the French having a republic, um, and of course, uh, the, the, the extent to which in the early years of the war, Wall Street 
at American munitions makers and American farmers and American industry are pumping out goods that they're selling to the allies, uh, which is keeping the war going. There's a, there really is a very strong anti-German bias, or at least pro-allied bias. And German Americans feel, well, that's not fair. We have a right to argue that our, our side, the side of our fathers and grandfathers, is correct. There, and there tends to be a whole outpouring of these sort of charity bazaars, that beautiful poster that you see in the, in the uh, center there. Winhold Rice was a noted graphic designer born in Germany who came over here to New York. And so he, in 1916, is generating this very colorful poster for a basically a fundraising party uh, for the widows and orphans of German and Austrian and Hungarian uh, uh, soldiers held in Madison Square Garden. We're not at war with Germany or, or Austria-Hungary yet, so they feel that they can have Madison Square Garden to do this. But it really is, for many German Americans, it really is a kind of, you know, a kind of internal struggle. And, and to me, one of the great examples of this is Hermann Hagedorn, who you've probably never heard of, but he was a publicist and writer uh, at the turn of the century, young German-American, born in New York, educated both at Harvard and at Gettingen in Germany. Um, and he, in 1914, wrote about as the war news came out from the beginning, the, 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 the first battles of the Western Front with the, with the British and French and Belgians fighting the Germans on the Western Front, and it's going back and forth like this a little bit. And what he said was, soberly gratified, though I might be at every German setback, every German victory set my Teutonic heart beating faster. In other words, he's internally torn because he feels, you know, the allies, England and France, it's representative government, it's democracy, it's the force of Western civilization as I as an American understand it, but I'm also proud to be German. And um, he, the way he resolves this is he eventually throws the, the pro-German stuff completely aside and is so suppressing of it that he becomes a real gung-ho uh, uh, advocate for, you know, America first, America always, forget the German part of it. We are going to go to war for the allies. And, um, you know, the fact is we have to resolve this internal conflict. So there are a lot of people, this, he's an intellectual, he's a writer, a thinker, but many people in their ordinary lives are having to contend with these kinds of questions of dual loyalties or conflicting loyalties. For some, uh, making the choice is a little easier uh, in terms of feeling very, on the other side of this, feeling very righteous and self-righteous about the need to uh, stand up for Germany and Austria-Hungary uh, before we join the war. And one of the most prominent of these people is George Sylvester Virick, who you see on the left, a young German immigrant, a poet, a bit of a bohemian, um, who in 1914 in New York City starts this magazine, this weekly magazine, The Fatherland, which eventually claims 100,000 weekly readers. Um, and he just pumps out this very clever, graphically, you know, beautiful, you know, well put together uh, magazine that's basically a propaganda sheet against the Allies, Allied hypocrisy, and for Germany and Austria. Um, and so, for example, you have, you know, in New York, uh, in the early years of the war, you have a magazine being published, The Fatherland, as shown on the far right, celebrating the Kaiser's birthday. And uh, German Americans are apparently buying this, feeling, I can celebrate the, the Kaiser's birthday. I'm an American, but I can celebrate the Kaiser's birthday, or read about how uh, you know, England is doing devious things diplomatically around the world. Um, as some of the previous speakers in this series, however, have clearly noted um, this gets very awkward because in 1915 in particular, a bunch of secret German documents that are diplomatic, uh, one of the uh, cultural attaches falls asleep on an elevated train and federal agents grab his bag and take it to Washington and they read it and they see that the German, first of all, the German government in Berlin is secretly funding the fatherland and other propaganda efforts in, in America. 
Um, they're also subsidizing efforts to divert ammunition and armaments from being sold to the Allies. They're buying them up and trying to set up actually a factory in Connecticut to siphon off supplies. Um, and actually, none of this turns out to be illegal. It breaks no law. But Woodrow Wilson and Colonel House, his advisor, uh, decide they're going to leak this sort of leak this information to the New York World, which was the most pro-administration Democratic newspaper in New York City. So in, in 1915, you get splashed across these headlines in the world. These, these kinds of stories about how Germany has worked in the US to shape opinion, block the allies, and get munitions for herself. Um, and that's a picture of George, our friend George Sylvester Vierick on the lower left of the newspaper being implicated as someone who's taking basically money from the Kaiser to publish this allegedly you know, independent journal, a pro-German journal in, in New York. And then in 1915 and 1916, um, things continue to get even more awkward for many German Americans. Um, if you heard Chad Millman or Howard Blum speak in your series, there are actually German espionage and sabotage efforts uh, that are authorized in Berlin. Um, there's, of course, the tremendous Black Tom explosion on the waterfront in Jersey City in July 1916 that you see in the middle image. Ironically enough, at the time, they couldn't prove it was German sabotage, trying to blow up all these munitions that were about to be shipped out of Jersey City to the Allies. Um, it was only years later that it was proven. But there were other episodes where um, German agents, including a Hoboken chemist named Dr. Walter Schiele, were actually putting together explosives, um, incendiary devices, which were being put on cargo ships by uh, German sa sailors who were stranded here. This is before, again, before we joined the war on April 17, but the cargo is going to the Allies um, from New York, and these ships are mysteriously catching fire in the middle of the ocean. And that is traced back to these German agents. So there's a sense in which there are saboteurs working here. Uh, for the Kaiser, who we're not at war, and they are the ones who are bringing the war to the shores of New Jersey and New York. And um, at the same time, German is becoming awkward for German Americans because, of course, on the Western Front, um, the German army is being accused of committing crimes against humanity. And we now know, that for decades, historians have argued back and forth, this is wartime allied propaganda, there's no proof, the allegations are so horrible of, of torture and, and mutilation of civilians by angry Germans in Belgium and France. The most recent historical study um, argues there were German atrocities. They weren't as sadistic and horrible, but many civilians, a couple of thousand civilians at the beginning of the war in, in Belgium and northern France were executed, not out of some kind of cold, calculated, brutal Prussian policy, so much as panic, drunkenness, confusion, friendly fire incidents between different German units, which they blamed on local civilians. It's young, unexperienced green troops being thrown into the beginning of one of the most hellish butcheries in world history. And they, that's not to excuse them for shooting <laughs> civilians. But the point, is, there's, uh, the point is that in America, the allies are sort of making sure that Americans get this story because the allies want America in. And Wilson keeps, President Wilson keeps saying, no, we're not gonna join the war. The, Flip side, the, the, the allied version of the fatherland is things like um, Lewis Raymaker's cartoon, which you see in the far right there, of a gorilla with sort of uh, corpses of naked women. And it's hard to see, perhaps, but it says that the little band across the gorilla's midriff says, Gott mit uns, which God with us, which was a uh, Prussian army slogan. Um, and it's an ironic pro-allied cartoon. Raymakers was a Dutchman who was bitterly anti-German, did these scathing cartoons. The English government says, hey, this guy's good. Let's send him to America and have him publish his cartoons there to stir up the Americans against the Germans. So between these sorts of things, you know, the, re the, the revelation of espionage, terrorism, 
um, and uh, anti-German <coughs> cartoons and propaganda, and of course the Lusitania, on which 128 Americans died in 1915. The, the wave of anti-German sentiment is, if anything, building pretty continuously <laughs> So that once we enter the war in April 1917, all the stops are pulled out, and you have this sort of barrage of anti-German propaganda officially sanctioned by the government, um, and uh, beat back the Hun, the Hun being this sort of epithet for German barbarians, um, buy liberty bonds, help, help the doughboys win the war, beat back the Hun. You have, as in the middle cartoon there, a James Montgomery flag, the great artist who did the famous I want you with Uncle Sam poster for the war, um, also did these anti-German um, cartoons. And this one, it, 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 what it's showing is a, a stereotypical German American sitting in his living room and he's holding the American flag out the window to show, oh yeah, I'm loyal to the United States, my adopted homeland. But inside, where no one can see him, he's hoisting the stein of beer and saying, hoch der Kaiser, you know, up with the Kaiser. Um, and the, the, the message of this is they're two-faced. You can't trust them. You can't trust German Americans. Yeah, there's some loyal ones, but um, we have an internal, a potential internal enemy. And more generally during the war, this 100% Americanism, um, prove it. Are you 100% American? Prove it. You have a whole nation of immigrants, not just New York. New York's sort of like the poster child, right, for, for multi-ethnicity. But uh, there is this sense of strident Americanism that you've got Austrians here, Germans here, you've got uh, Hungarians, you've got people from Central Europe who may be loyal to the Emperor of, of Austria and so on. So um, you have to, the, the sense is there's a kind of paranoia and a sense that you have to prove yourself. And it gets uglier in that uh, where, for example, uh, on the left, Numerous cases across the country, but in New York City as well, where German Americans who are outspoken after we joined the war were grabbed by mobs, made to kneel, and made to kiss the American flag as a humiliation. Um, and this is an instance from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle newspaper in 1918. Um, Hun champion gets drubbing, is made to kiss flag, loses job. This is a young German American man in, in native of Brooklyn who works in Manhattan, who made the mistake of continually saying, oh, I'm glad the Germans have won this latest battle. Now, he was A, stupid, and B, tasteless and insensitive at a time when American troops are already fighting in those battles. And in a sense, he's saying, you know, oh, I'm, I hope the Doughboys get, get killed. But, but the, the, the consequence of it for this guy were that he was beaten, made to kiss the flag, and fired. And none of the mainstream newspapers that covered this say anything about the First Amendment. It's all about guy got what he deserved. There is sort of a, a blanket um, uh, uh, cultural moment of accepting this kind of thing. And on the right, you have um, one result of the, the Wilson administration's policy, which was uh, fingerprinting and registering um, all German non-citizens, that is, a resident aliens who had not taken out uh, American citizenship, um, had to go to a police office, get fingerprinted and ID'd. So we're watching you. We've got you now. And uh, this, is, this is it happening in a, this, the, the pictures of it happening in a precinct in, um, in, in New York City. 40,000 New York City German non-citizens and 20,000 of their wives, whether the wives were German born or not, had to be registered this way. And the quote on the top, um, you couldn't walk, this is a woman, Helen Wagner, interviewed in the late 20th century when she was an old lady, talking about her youth uh, during World War I on the, on the, in Yorkville, on the Upper East Side, which used to be very German. She's remembering, during the war, you couldn't walk the street with a German paper under your, your arm. You'd be, uh, you would be abused from one end of the block to the other. We kept speaking German at home but we avoided it 
in the street. That exemplifies what German Americans, what happened to German Americans across the country during the war, is a sense of we can't be overtly proud of being German anymore. Um, and so um, this is what Germans encountered during World War I. Um, Irish New Yorkers, 676,000 of them, actually more if you count third and fourth generation. Again, proud of being American, certainly proud of their contribution in earlier wars, the Civil War. Uh, you know, they have embedded themselves in New York City, certainly in Tammany Hall, certainly in the Catholic Church. They've acquired a real uh, steam and power. Um, and uh, the mayor at this point of New York during the first years of the war is John Peroy Mitchell, who was an I Irish Catholic. He was actually arguably the first Latino mayor of New York City because he had a grandparent who was from Venezuela. Uh, but uh, he is actually an ardent allies right or wrong. He's very angry uh, about uh, any pro-German sentiment in New York. But it's a little different for many of the other Irish in New York. Um, there really is, this is the period which culminates in the uh, Dublin uprising at Easter 1916, which is the, the beginning of the ultimately successful um, independence movement for Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, during the war. Um, and in New York, Irish Americans are, are divided. Some are very pro-allied, but others look at this war and say, wait a minute, why are we in such a hurry to help England win this war? Um, England is the colonial master of our homeland, and there is a viable movement to free Ireland from that. And in New York, you get different debates. You have someone like William Burke Cochran on the left there, who was a prominent Democratic Party politician and former congressman who argued for home rule that the solution is that the Irish uh, within the British Empire um, acquire a kind of semi-autonomy which will, which will free them from a sense of oppression by Protestant England. Um, on the other hand, you have uh, much more radical factions uh, exemplified in part by the gentleman in the middle there, Jeremiah O'Leary. Um, there's a real militant argument for revolution for just throwing the British out. And that's what culminates in the, um, the uh, Dublin uprising in 1916, which many of these New York militants are, are supportive of. And in fact, in making their calculations, either in Ireland or in New York or elsewhere in the United States, these militants are saying, let's, side, let's help Germany win. If Germany wins this war, they will weaken the British Empire. And one of the things we will insist upon in being in cahoots with the Germans is that they free Ireland. So there are many of the more militant um, Irish Republicans in this period in New York are pro-German in the sense that they want Germany to defeat England and therefore free Ireland. And Jeremiah O'Leary publishes this magazine called Bull in New York, which is kind of a humorous political magazine um, that spreads this message um, of Ir Irish independence. And um, this actually, we have the copy of this magazine in our ex exhibition at the Museum of the City of New York on posters and patriotism. What's fascinating about it is that um, this is already in, what is it, September? Uh, yeah, September 1917. We, the US are already in the war. And what's happening, he's well aware that the federal agents are gonna come and shut him down because they see this as now his anti-English uh, uh, sentiments are, are treacherous and they can use the Espionage Act of 1917 to just shut down the, new, the magazine. So this is one of the last issues and he does something very, very sort of tongue in cheek and sly, which is that he has this big uh, Union Jack, English, flag, right, on the cover of the magazine as if it's a, he's, he's, maybe he's turned, you know, a, a new leaf and he's decided to become pro-English. But if you, if you look inside the magazine and read the article accompanying this cover, the real point he's making is the English just dictate to Americans and we just take it and, you know, New York is basically a, 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 you know, a, a city that's a lackey to the English. 
Um, and therefore, if you walk down Fifth Avenue, all you're gonna see is English flags as if it wasn't even America. <laughs> but he does get shut down. Um, and uh, so there is all of this sort of roiling going on within uh, Irish America in New York. Jews, one million Jewish New Yorkers. By this period, it's the largest Jewish city that ever existed. Um, and that, of course, is largely because of the great waves of Jews from Eastern Europe who arrive at Ellis Island, or in New York Harbor, I should say, from the 1880s on through this period. Um, to a large extent, yes, many, many for, for economic reasons, fleeing poverty, seeking opportunity like all the other immigrants, but also very specifically fleeing czarist anti-Semitism. The czar, the, the, the imperial government of Russia at this time, before the Russian Revolution, bitterly anti-Jewish for a variety of reasons, but Jews are the scapegoats um, of, of the czar. And so you have these pogroms, as you see in the center, that cause many Jews to flee Eastern Europe, especially the Russian Empire, which at this, at this point also includes Lithuania, Poland, uh, the Ukraine, uh, vast areas with large Jewish populations. And of course, they come through uh, Ellis Island, and many of them end up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. But again, this war starts. The allies are England, OK, constitutional monarchy. France, liberal republic, and czarist Russia. Autocratic, anti-Semitic, corrupt, inept, medieval in many ways. And many Jews and actually many progress, political progressives in America are looking at this coalition and saying, These are this, this is the side we are supposed to join against Germany? Eh, I don't know about that. And there's more generally a kind of, a kind of sadness in the Jewish community because even though the Russian government and uh, an army is anti-Semitic, they're still drafting Jews. They need people to serve. And so many Jews are actually serving the Tsar on the Eastern Front during the war. And this is actually a piece of sheet music, Yiddish sheet music published on the Lower East Side during the early years of the war, a letter from Sweetheart. And it's a very maudlin song, but the lyrics are basically about how this guy, this husband and wife in you know, Russia, uh, uh, are parted because he's drafted and here he is saying goodbye and he's going to join the troops uh, in, the, in the Tsar's army uh, marching by and of course he gets killed in the war and it's a sad song. And this is being published in America uh, by relatives of these kinds of, of these people. You know, um, I'm thinking about what's going on to their relatives uh, across the ocean. So there's not a great enthusiasm among many New York Jews uh, for the Allied Cause. And this is exacerbated during the war by the fact that the Tsar's army starts up again and starts pogroms during the war. They lose a battle, they take it out on the local Jews. They use Jews as human shields, uh, pushing them towards the front lines with the Germans and the Austrians. So you have refugee crisis. Um, you have Jews in America saying, again, I mean, why would we side with, with the allies if this is one of the allies? And then, of course, you have the very vigorous left in New York, which in this period is, is uh, ensconced in the labor unions. Many of the sort of Jewish labor leaders and leftists in New York are themselves refugees, political refugees from the Tsar, like Emma Goldman, the great um, uh, uh, anarchist leader who you see giving a speech in Union Square in Manhattan during the war. Um, so there are all of these reasons why Jews are less than, um, less than enthusiastic. The left in New York, New York being the really sort of one of the, one of the hubs of the political left in the country by this period. Um, socialists and anarchists, by and large, don't take sides at all in the war. They condemn the war. The war is a, is a capitalist conspiracy, killing the working people of Europe for the benefit of kings and capitalists. Italians. Uh, this is Mulberry Street in Little Italy. Uh, over half a million and growing, very much so, in the same period, of course, that Hoboken is becoming um, the great, a great Italian city. A little bit more straightforward for many Italian Americans uh, in that um, when Italy declares war on Germany and Austria-Hungary in May of 1915, 
It's easy for Italian Americans to feel uh, a, a unity with the home country. There's a sense of, of resentment of the fact that the Austro-Hungarian Empire still holds on to pieces of territory where the majority of people are, are Italian speakers. Trieste and Trentino to the northeast of what was then the Italian state. So there's a notion of a war of liberation that we're going to join the Allies, fight Germany and Austria-Hungary and seize back from the Austrians what is rightfully ours. So once again, you have this flow of Italian immigrants to a, con a flow of immigrants into a consulate, reservists, to go ship back across to Genoa or Naples and join the Italian army. Um, and so you have this sense of, um, of almost a crusade. Um, and uh, so again, you have a bunch of different things going on here. You've got Italian nationalism. This is an Italian poster of the Italian act, you know, um, guy with the ax symbolically. He's got about the chop, the hand, the grasping hand of Austria uh, on, on the Piave River in Italy. Uh, you've got these sort of stereotypical, once, we're, once we join the war, then it becomes easy for there to be this kind of a pro-US uh, propaganda. You're serving Italy and America. From Tony from Mulberry, from Mulberry Street in the heart of Little Italy will do his bit. Again, though, you have internal conflict in that you have uh, not as, not as um, you have a vibrant left also among Italian immigrants, anarchists and socialists who are also anti-war. Not as large a proportion of, the, of, the, of that population as in the Jewish community, but it is, it is there. So you also have um, Italian leftists who say, the hell with all of this, um, let, us, let us stay out of the war. Last but not least, African Americans, about 100,000 black New Yorkers, only about 2% of the New York City population in 1910, but that's growing. Um, and it's in this period, really, that Harlem is becoming the capital of black America. Um, and part of that has to do with war jobs, the fact that you can leave the South or leave the Caribbean islands and come to New York and, of course, other northern and midwestern cities where there are now, because there's such a demand for armaments, for ammunition, for war supplies, um, they're willing to hire black labor, even though the white labor unions, by and large, don't like it. Um, factories start hiring black labor and workshops, so there's, there are jobs. And so you have this great migration of African Americans uh, into New York and other cities, and it really builds Harlem in this period, very much as a part of the war economy. So you have actually, uh, you can see there are African American workers in this New York City uh, chemical factory in, uh, in 1917. Once we join the war, however, you have the same set of kind of internal soul searching and, and argument in this community as in many of the others. You have W.E.B. Du Bois, the great uh, uh, NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the great civil rights organization of that day, uh, based in New York, um, arguing in the crisis, which is his, his magazine, um, we must stand shoulder to shoulder with our white brothers in this war. This is after, after Wilson declares war in April 1917 and Congress uh, enacts uh, the war declaration. And his argument is, if we do this, they will have to accord us more civil rights because we will have proven ourselves on the battlefield and we will have proven ourselves as, uh, as Americans. Um, so he sees it as a civil rights move for black Americans to, to uh, submit to being drafted into a completely Jim Crow army. It's completely segregated. Uh, but he say, okay, let's do it, and, and good things may come from it. At the same time, you have Marcus Garvey, the Jamaican-born leader of the Back to Africa movement, who's now relocated to Harlem, also feeling that maybe um, the war will shake, loosen things up, and we'll have a less colonialized world that Africa may be freed. After all, Woodrow Wilson keeps talking about self-determination. We're in the war for idealistic reasons, primarily according to Wilson. We're gonna free small nations. We're going to cut imperialism, right? And so uh, Garvey is hopeful that maybe this means that 
it will be Africa for the Africans, controlled by the Africans uh, after the war. And you do have, of course, as you heard from Jeffrey Sammons uh, in one of your presentations about the Harlem Hellfighters, the 369th Infantry, um, and uh, James Reese Europe, its band leader from Harlem, one of New York's most accomplished musicians, who really helps turn jazz into a transatlantic phenomenon by taking dance music from New York uh, to France, where he performs for the French and for American troops, um, and um, uh, really, consequently, Paris by the early 20s is a jazz city, just like New York City was. And of course, the Harlem Hellfighters do get into battle under the French and, uh, and prove themselves and get the Croix de Guerre, the French uh, military award. So there are things to be proud about. There are things to be uh, hopeful about. But you also have the other side, which is the American pogroms. Uh, the St. Louis, East St. Louis, Illinois race riots of, of the summer, spring and summer of 1917, when white, precisely because again, blacks from the south are coming north into these Midwestern and Northern factory towns to get jobs, white workers are fearful, angry, feel they're gonna lose their jobs, all the racism gets aroused and there are these vicious attacks on African Americans um, and in New York, in July of 1917, with the support of Du Bois and others, there is this great silent parade of African Americans from Harlem marching down Fifth Avenue with banners really saying things, you know, Wilson's big line was, we're gonna make the world safe for democracy. They're, they have these huge ironic banners, Mr. Wilson, make America safe for democracy first. Uh, and they're carrying, uh, you know, banners about how uh, Crispus Attucks was the first Patriot to die for America in the American Revolution, the black uh, a sailor who was killed at the Boston Massacre, and so on. So the war is very, very much present for black America. And then you've got the true bitterness. You get the faction in Harlem that just says, oh, give me a break, enough, enough is enough. Um, and this is the Messenger magazine, which was a socialist party magazine for blacks in Harlem immediately after the war. And this, as far as I'm concerned, this anticipates Malcolm X and the Black Panthers. This is 1919. The cartoon says, the new crowd Negro making America safe for himself, giving the Hun a dose of his own medicine, by which, ironically, they mean the Hun are white soldiers in America who lynched black soldiers or attacked black uh, communities. And what he's saying is, OK, by any means necessary, if we have to take guns, and this is actually more cotton. Robert Abbott, the, 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 the big black, the, the most important black publisher in Chicago, whose paper, the Chicago Defender, was distributed up and down the rail lines uh, through into the South. He had a, an editorial, he said, if you have to die, take at least one of them with you, with a very clear message uh, about arming oneself. The person in Harlem who was as much responsible for this cartoon as anyone else was a young man named A. Philip Randolph, socialist, emigre from Florida. Um, and what he wrote in 1917 in The Messenger was no intelligent Negro is willing to lay down his life for the United States that now exists. And he almost gets thrown into prison for counseling draft evasion, as other socialists did. Well, with the years, A. Philip Randolph remained one of Harlem's, in fact, he became even more a leader uh, of black Harlem. He became the leader of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the most important and powerful black labor union in the country. And for decades had a dream about a march on Washington, which he almost got FDR to permit um, his own politics became more moderate, more integrationist with time. And ultimately in 1963, A. Philip Randolph, who you see here, is with Dr. King, <coughs> Whitney Young of the Urban League, Roy Wilkins of the NAACP, Walter Ruther of the United Auto Workers, and the March, the I Have a Dream March on Washington. Um, and the legacy of that period of what do we do about the racial dilemma in, in America really, in a sense, begins in Harlem in 1917 for him uh, during the war. 
blacks come back from the war, and Du Bois, who was embittered by the lynching and the race riots and everything else, was able to say, though, okay, you know, we return, we return from fighting, we return fighting. In other words, we're not gonna give up in the face of the lynch mobs and the, the racist pogroms uh, across the country. And the NAACP, of course, continues to be one of the great uh, uh, bulwarks of the civil rights movement. And um, into the early years of the Harlem Renaissance, there's both anger but also pride about the role that African Americans played uh, in, in the war years in New York. And so what is, uh, I'm, time to wrap this up. Well, these are the last few images I have. What is the moral of this story? What does it all add up to? I think there are two broader points which may seem to be in complete uh, contradiction or conflict with each other, but I think concurrently they're both true for this period in American history. One is that immigrants came out, of immigrants and ethnic Americans, came out, and ethnic New Yorkers, came out of that war um, feeling pride and Americanization. Hey, we proved, we went over there in the trenches. We went over there in the Moose Argonne Offensive. We lost our friends. Um, some of us came back maimed. Um, we proved that we were willing to fight for America. We were willing to prove that we were brave, that we would sacrifice. And now I can come back and I'm not just a WAP or a kike or whatever anymore. You have to look at me as an American. And yes, I'm also a Jew or an Irishman or, or an Italian American or what have you. And of course, it's exemplified by some of the more, the well-known people uh, uh, who fought in the war came out. Father Francis Duffy of the Fighting 69th. That's the statue that's in the middle of Times Square. He was the scrappy uh, Catholic, uh, Irish Catholic chaplain for uh, the 69th, who's, uh, which was a largely Irish regiment, fought in the Civil War, fought in World War I on the Western Front. Mm -hmm. Of course, young aviator Fiorella LaGuardia had already been a congressman, um, took time off for Congress to go uh, fight uh, in Europe during the war, comes back to become arguably the greatest mayor uh, eventually in, 19, in the 30s, uh, the greatest mayor New York City ever had. And German Amer even German Americans, they were drafted, so many volunteered, others are drafted. If you go to Ridgewood, Queens, which was next to, next to Bushwick, you go from Bushwick, Brooklyn, to Ridgewood, Queens, that was a German belt at this time, heavily German, heavily German. To this day, Ridgewood is one of the last neighborhoods in New York which has an overt, some overtly German remnants. This is the war memorial for World War I, which Ridgewood was very sure to put up in the 1920s to show just how many of the neighborhood boys had served and how many of them had died. And if you look at this list, I know it's hard to see, awful lot of German names. Not all of them are German names, but it was a heavily German. This is a way of saying, look, we're Americans and we did this uh, like everyone else did. Jews too had heroes. Um, Maury Morrison was just an ordinary guy from Brooklyn who said years later, I figured this country was different from Russia. It was worth fighting for. In other words, once we're in the war, um, okay, I'm an American, I'm going to fight. Plus, made easier by the Russian Revolution, the Tsars deposed. Also, the fact that the Balfour Declaration, the English come out for the notion of a, of a, of a Jewish settlement in Palestine that they're going to support. So it's sort of a trifecta for American Jews. We're in the war, no more Tsar. Zionism is being endorsed by one of the key allies. Um, and, and so many of these guys went over. Uh, uh, Louis Isaacson was a Romanian immigrant, ordinary guy, lost his eye to a German attack on the Western Front. Kratoshinsky was actually a hero who helped rescue the so-called Lost Battalion on the, on the Moose Argonne offense, during the Moose Argonne offensive at the end of the war. Um, he was just a Polish Jewish immigrant barber in Lower Manhattan but uh, Jewish publications and organizations were enormously proud of him um, at, the, uh, at the end of the war. The other side of the coin, however, was that, so one argument is pride, Americanization, I belong now, I fought, I can come home feeling comfortable in New York and America. The other side, the one that's sort of contradictory to that was the great wave of intolerance, hatred, anger, even hysteria that 
built up during the war with all of this anti-German, anti-Hun stuff, um, and, and poured over into the post-war period. This is Armistice Day uh, in New York City, and there are pictures of people just going crazy with the war's over, being happy. These guys, this is the, the last day of the war, and they're gathering, and what are they doing? They're hanging in effigy, a, a, a dummy with a German cross on it, and none of them look too, uh, they look more grim than anything else. The spirit of sort of repressing anything seen as un-American, as you see the statistics of people who were arrested uh, for disrupting the war effort during the war. That's pro-German, quote, quote unquote, pro-Germans, pacifists, religious objectors, leftists who opposed the war. Um, and this kind of mainstream press uh, uh, portrayal, enemy alien menace, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of added fuel to the flames into the immediate post-war period. As many of you know, the Red Scare, the fact that out of the war, there is this, now there's, a, there's the Bolshevik Revolution, there is a, a communist Russia. And you have leftists and police battling it out. You have the Palmer Raids, where leftists in New York uh, were basically uh, arrested. Those who were not uh, naturalized citizens were deported to Russia. Um, uh, and at the same time, that's in counterpoint with these acts of leftist terrorism like an anarchist bombing on Wall Street in September of 1920, which killed 38 people. It's a, a feeling, people are feeling maybe the class war is coming here. And uh, on either side of that, there's a great amount of fear and, um, and hostility. The 100% Americanism slogan from the war is picked up literally by the Ku Klux Klan, which is revived in this period across the country. Um, you see them uh, in long, their march in Long Branch, New Jersey, down the main street in the 1920s, Red Bank. The state headquarters for the Klan in the early 20s was in West Hoboken, which is now part of Union City. So this is close to home. And the main thing was fear of, it was, it's Protestant, native-born Protestant fear of Jews and Catholics more than anything else plays a major role in the politics of the day. But this is the other side of this war kind of militarism, the 100% the hyper-patriotism sort of overflows after the war into this. And this is my, believe it or not, this is my last slide. Um, this is the, the, bless you, this is the ultimate um, grim vestige of this, which was that um, there were a number of influential New Yorkers who were in military intelligence uh, during the war who were persuaded that uh, the Jews of New York were pro-German because they were leftist, because of this business with the czar. And um, John B. Trevor was, an, was a lawyer, well-heeled, blue blood lawyer, Yale-educated, um, who uh, became convinced that there was going to be a revolution on the Lower East Side uh, by armed Bolshevik Jews, um, and he wanted, he wanted Washington to send him machine gun crews in 1919 to cordon off the entire area, and they said, nah, but we'll send you some, you know, a couple of thousand uh, rifles, um, and of course it never happened, but this is the map that he had generated in August 1919 for a state committee investigating seditious activities. Um, so what he did, it, it's all ethnic. It's all ethnic, so the different colors are different ethnic groups in Manhattan. He did this map for the whole city. This is just a piece of it. So the, the red you see up there are Russian Jews, right, all along the, the, the Lower East Side. He's got, uh, in this map, C, the C, the brown Cs are Italians. Um, he's got some Germans in there, and on the rest of the map, he's got you know, Chinese, Irish, Austro-Hungarians, Scandinavians, French, et cetera, Negro. Um, he used this as evidence uh, in Congress to push for the 1924 Immigration Restriction Act, which was the act which successfully narrowed the quotas for immigration from Europe to make sure that people from Southern and Eastern Europe would not be able to get over here in, in large numbers. And it was very explicitly backed by the Klan by various racialist thinkers who believe that Jews 
Catholics, Italians, Southern and Eastern Europeans were a threat to the country. And that law stood until 1965 when the new law came, which has basically turned the country into what it is now, a place where uh, people from all over the world uh, are welcome uh, far more even than before this law was the case. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, there's a sobering history here. It's an Americanizing positive event for all of these groups, uh, even when it generates internal debate and conflict. But it's also a moment where forces of real suppression and intolerance are unleashed uh, in, in America. Um, and so those are the two legacies. And sometimes you wonder if this is actually a century ago or, or not. Anyway, thank you very much. Sorry.